All right, let's do this. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Board Game Barbecue Podcast. This is Jules here. It is episode 275, the first one for 2024, and I have most of the Queensland crew here. I've got Def. How are you doing? Good, mate. How are you? I'm doing really well. Really excited to catch up about all the things that have been happening over the Christmas break period. Mm -hmm. And I've got Adrian. How are you doing? Awesome. Good to be back, actually. Yep. It's good to be back. And we did do a little Patreon podcast yesterday, Jules and I, but I was very – I'm really weird about how we record because I'm like, I don't want to know anything. Don't talk to me about anything. Let's just – we're doing the Patreon pod. I don't want to know about your holiday or all your stuff because I want to talk about it when we're here together yes. on this show. So yeah. Yeah. You get nothing but genuine reactions and yeah. unnecessary hype. <laughs> yeah, I'm, a, I'm weird about that. Hey, I'm really, I don't like it. I'm like, shh, 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 I don't want to know. So, yeah. All right. Well, um, it's the first episode of 2024. And we, as I said, we've all had a break uh, from podcast recording over the Christmas period. And I'm hoping that means that we've had some time to play some games. Does anyone want to kick off what they've been playing? I haven't played that much, if I'm honest. I've just been flat out. You've like, been smoking a lot. Yeah, that's right. It's <laughs> smoking right. meats, I should say. <laughs> that's okay. Everyone knows what you meant, right? Uh, oh. But, yeah, like we had the Boxing Day party here and I was lucky enough that you guys were both there, which was kind yeah, of cool. It was, it, was it was pretty great. fun. And everyone was playing games. And my agreement with MJ was that I could invite anyone that I wanted, but I wasn't allowed to play games until after – five o'clock or something. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was, it was good. It was fun. It was really nice to have everybody there. We even had the guys from all the meeples there. There was just mm -hmm. like, yeah, a heap of people hanging out. It was great. It was nice to see brothers, uh, De brothers, death, no death's brother there. Got to meet him and hang out and he got to play games with you guys, which was cool to watch and yeah, yeah duck my head in and say hello. So how'd you guys go? What do you think of the brisket? Did it live oh, up to any hype mate. or not? It absolutely lived up to the hype. <laughs> <laughs> Jules's face when he ate it, I could see it. He just came back of an empty plate and was like, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely have some more of that. I felt guilty because I was like, I want to make sure everyone else gets some. <laughs> well, I had a bit of a debate with MJ because the day before, or two days before when I bought them, she said, just get one. Like, we've got a ham, just get one. Three is insane. And I was like, we need three. We but your insane brain was right. <laughs> it was because it was the perfect amount. Everyone yeah. had plenty. They had a little bit of seconds and it was all gone at the end of the day. So mm -hmm. it worked out perfectly. So, yeah, it was fun. It was a very yeah. fun day. Uh, it, it lived up to the hype. That was delicious. It was yeah. so, so good. Well, while we're on the topic of that Boxing Day, I might talk about one of the games I got to play for the first time that Def taught me, and that mm. was Nucleum. Nice. And I, I I enjoyed it. I had a pretty good time. Um, it's I know we've talked about it. Adrian sizzled it before. I'm pretty sure on the podcast, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of talk about it being this hybrid between brass and barrage. And I can kind of see what people are talking about. I feel it's a lot more similar to brass than it is barrage. Um, Agreed. And I, I had a good time. And I would play it again. It's not one I feel like I need to own. And I feel like because it has that similarities, I feel like Brass just scratches the itch a bit better. I don't mm -hmm. know. What are your guys' thoughts? Uh, sorry, Def, but it wasn't in my top 10, right? And yeah, there you go. And Barrage still sitting there, like, mm -hmm. you know, and I just it's my number one for a reason. I can see the similarities to brass more. I completely agree yes. because it's networks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I think the power element comes in for the barrage part of it, but also I think the asymmetrical experiments like in mm -hmm. barrage, you get that asymmetry. So in this, you get the asymmetry, but yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy the game. I've played it a few times every time I've enjoyed playing it. So. Yeah, I thought it was really good. I had a really good time and I think, um, 
I think that, you know, when when we compare these games, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, one of them should be preferred over the other in terms of gaming. Like, I honestly think that because I like Brass and Barrage, I enjoyed Nucleum as well. So Nucleum doesn't do something mind-blowingly new, but it does things that work for us, or for me personally at least, and that's why I enjoyed playing it. I, uh, you know, it almost seemed like a fresh take on very successful, you know, things that click in my head. Yeah. So f- from that aspect, it's it's almost the same thing as Age of Innovation, which I played a heaps last year. It's because I enjoy the the guy project slasher Mystica mechanics and type of game so much. I I loved Age of Innovation. Is it better than Guy Project? It isn't. Uh, with Nucleum, I've only played it, you know, a few times. There are some parts of the game that I think are really enjoyable, like the action selection mechanic with the tiles is very clever. Yeah, the, I do like that. I think that's, you know, that is something that it does different, and I think that is a very enjoyable part of the game. There's a couple of things that I thought, you know, didn't quite live up to what I was expecting them to be, like the turbines, they didn't seem as impactful. yeah. In the game, um, ultimately, there's there's quite a few of them on the on the board, so you can sort of almost always transport as much uranium as you need. But very enjoyable game, a lot of fun. Uh, played it again with with other people after a few days, and again after that. So yeah, it was great fun. Yeah, very good. Um, other games we got to play on that day, Adrian. I kind of started to peak at about 5 36 o'clock <laughs> I after <noticed> having that. <laughs> many many cocktails <laughs> many 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 and the meat didn't soak it all up let's just say that <laughs> so I remember sitting down next to Jules and playing no thanks and yes. having an absolute blast like that was I I couldn't comprehend exactly all the things on such a simple game. But man, I enjoyed it. Just the back chat, the banter, everyone giving everybody hell. It was just fun. Like I really enjoyed that game and I would love to play it again. And it was that right place, right time, perfect game, perfect situation. And yeah, absolutely loved it. So. Yeah. There was a lot of um you know, when the it, for those who haven't played No Thanks, it's a very simple game. A deck of cards with numbers that range from three to thirty-five from memory. And you shuffle the whole thing up, you take nine cards out at random, and basically you flip over a card from the deck, and everyone has a bunch of these black um, tokens. And if you don't want to take the card, you have to put a token on it and say, no thanks, and it goes around to the next person. And it keeps going round until someone takes the card and they get to take the tokens. Mm. Now, the tokens you have... This is a game where you're trying to get the lowest score possible. So the lower card number, the better, but also the black tokens you have at the end of the game minus from your score as well. So they help bring that score down. And so the one of the clever things about the game is if you get sequential numbers, say you've got seven, eight, and nine, you put the lowest number on top and tuck all the sequential numbers underneath it and you do not score them. So you're trying to get numbers that are next to each other. And as the game went round, there was plenty of those moments, as Adrian might remember, where a number comes out and you go, oh, that person needs it. Yeah. Let's not let them have it. <laughs> not getting that for free. No <laughs> exactly. way. It's so good. Yeah, so, yeah, it. there's so much um, great laughs. It's a very simple game. takes 15 minutes to play. And there's because you take out some of those cards at random, you're hoping that card you need to bring maybe two piles together to lower that score comes out. You might not get it. You might take it. Like, so it might come out, but then someone goes, I'm not letting you have that. I'll just take the score hit and hopefully that <laughs> screws your game over. But you just go again and again. You just play multiple rounds. It's a great game. Another great game that we played just after that. And the reason why it was great is because I love the game regardless. It was, it was high society, right? We got to play mm-hmm. that. But MJ's brother, who plays absolutely zero, zero, zero board games. I mean, we tried to teach him a couple a couple of Christmases ago and it was hard work and he didn't enjoy it. And he kind of yeah. mocked the game so that 
you know what I mean? Not tanked it, but just mocked the situation and made light of it, but didn't really understand it. But anyway, got to play high society with him. And he didn't fully get it at the start, but as the game progressed, he did. And I th- he really enjoyed it. And he actually messaged me a few days later and said, I know I don't really like board games, but I had a great time like hanging out with your friends and playing that game. And I can see why <laughs> you enjoy them. And that was a brutal game as well. And trying to, I don't know, just trying to not spend the most money and you know all of that shenanigans in that game. It's fantastic. It's a hit every time. So yeah, that was yeah. great to play that with him and experience that with him. So. Yeah, no, that was good fun. That's great stuff. Um, I have my brother here, obviously, like Adrian said, and we've we've played a lot of games. He he got into board games last year and (laughs) sort of jumped into the deep end. And we've we've played like just. I was just looking at my list now, and it's it's a lot. It's a fair bit. And that's an understatement. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll read out the list. But okay. before I do that, there, I want to explain the story behind it. So I got contacted by a member of our community that said, yo, Dev, I need you to convince me not to sell my Lacerda games because I rarely play them. And I said, well, how often is rarely? How, how often do you play them? He goes, you know. Maybe I'll play one of them each quarter or something like that. So they will each get a game a year if I'm lucky. And I said, all of a sudden, you know, I wanted started typing a response. And then I said, took a step back and said, mate, I don't think I'm qualified to answer this because I've I've played some of these games over 40 times each. So I I, I have no, you know, I, I, I don't feel like I'm in a position to tell you <laughs> what to do if you play them once every quarter. I have some games that I play once every quarter, and some I keep and some I sell. But that led me to go back to my list. So just in the last 30 days, I've played Nucleum three times, Voidfall four times, Age of Steam four times, Hegemony, 1846, John Company, Underwater Cities, Mage Knight, City of the Big Shoulders, Spirit Island twice, Barrage, Brass Birmingham, Guy Project, Oath, Too Many Bones, Great Western Trail, Kanban EV, Scholars of the South Tigris, To Let Him Escape, Land Weather Machine. And that's just the games that are over two hours long. That so is it's, wow. mental. It's a fair <laughs> bit. Like, it's a, it's binge, a fair right? bit. But what I wanted to share is the story of how my brother is reacting to these games. So I still cannot get used to how quickly. <laughs> yeah, but it's how quickly he reacts to what he likes and what he doesn't, right? Mm-hmm. So it takes me a bit of getting used to, and I wonder if it is just a symptom of somebody that is new to a lot of these games and, you know, just decides very quickly, oh, this isn't for me, oh, yeah, I like this more, or... Maybe I was the same when I first started. I, I can't remember, to be honest. But because I like spending time with the games, I don't particularly relate with someone that makes a decision within the first few minutes of playing a game. I like this. I don't like this. I I know you've talked this- about it before, Def, how your brother and, and yourself come from having... Uh, a video game background. Do you think yeah. it comes from there? Of like, you get into the game, you're 15 minutes in, you go, yeah, no, nah, I'm not really driving with this. Yeah, it, it could be. It, off. It, it very well could be, Jules. But at the same time, I'm trying to think, you know, why shouldn't he be allowed? Well, not allowed. It's not as if I'm telling him, no, you should like this or not like this. But <laughs> You will it, sit it, down and you will play sit on down Mars. And play this. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> because if, if he plays a game and we played... I'll bring up an example. We played Voidfall for the first time, and he loved it. He immediately said, this is fantastic. I want to play again. And then we played we played Kanban EV, and he said, eh, it's it's good, but I, haven't, I didn't enjoy it as much as the other games. Okay. And I was like, well, hang on. <laughs> you know, it, the, all of these games, the, there's so many good games that the comparisons now are absolutely brutal. Mm. So you know, that led me to thinking to this topic I wanted to discuss with you guys today. What's the deal with the games that we genuinely think, you know, need more time with the players to to shine? And the game I was thinking is the game I taught at the Brisbane Game Day, John Company. Yeah. Everybody enjoyed it. Everybody had a great time. 
But me having played the game with a regular group multiple times, the same people, I saw that the experience everybody was getting was not the full a, experience yeah, of the a game. Fraction, yeah. It's a fraction of the game. And so, you know, what do we do with these? Do we demand that all the games sort of give you their best chance, their best punch right out the gate? And if they win you over, great. If not, that's it. They lost their chance. Or do we make some room and say, hey, yes, this is a game that requires a couple of plays to get to get into it and, and get the full experience of it. And that should still be fine. I think, you know, obviously both of these things can can work for different people, but I have seen it a lot more evident now with my brother here. Mm -hmm. You know, um, half an hour into 1846, he goes, I'm not quite sure I'm enjoying this. And I said, well, th it's an interesting observation to make 30 minutes in in a seven or eight hour game. So <laughs> strap in. <laughs> this is... <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, yeah uh, it's it's interesting i as you're talking about this this dilemma about you know some games are just they really do require multiple plays in order to get that full experience i, I don't necessarily see some publishers doing this but i wonder if some games might warrant you know you've got the the play time you've got the age and maybe there needs to be just a recommended play count to really understand mm. the game i mean john company is a perfect example of that yes. i'm pretty certain in the rule book for oath they say you need to play this multiple yes. times to get that full experience you're not going to get it after one yeah it's i don't know it's just one of those things that there are just games out there that they don't unlock everything they don't reveal all the game has to offer in one play and it's hard. It definitely is. Which is great, right? There's there's games yeah. for every every type of situation. There's definitely times where I want to just play a one-off thing. I don't want to have to worry about, you know, playing it nine times to, to get the full experience. And there's other times where I really, really enjoy exploring games a lot more and replaying them a lot. So, but it's it's just been an interesting observation to to sort of see my brother going through these notions of, deciding very, very quickly what he likes and what he doesn't. But at the same time, I've been showing him some of the best games I've ever played. And so, mm. like I said before, the comparisons are brutal. You know, comparing Voidfall or Mage Knight with Kanban EV, he immediately said, yeah, I prefer Mage Knight. I prefer Voidfall. I don't yeah, want to play wow. Kanban EV again. I want to play these other two things. But when <laughs> I asked him why, he said he felt Kanban EV was too difficult. He thought he couldn't figure out the sequence of movements for Sandra mm. and what the impact yeah, right. would be. And I said, well, that's a typical reaction to somebody playing this game for the first time. Like, I, I was the same way. So you, you at, at that point, you get into the discussion, you need to give this game more time. And then, of course, the counter argument is, why would I? I enjoyed this yeah. other game a lot more on my first play. So why shouldn't I play that? And that's a very valid, yeah? It is, yeah, very valid. Yeah, very well. I think as well, it just it really depends on so many parameters as well. It like does, so many things does. that you can't even account for. Tiredness. Tiredness mm -hmm. is a massive factor. It is. In, and hype also weighs in on it. And you get that Matrix 2 effect where you are so hyped to play this amazing game. You play it and go, it's all right. It, it's not as what I thought it was going to be. Mm. I thought it was going to be better. And then that way you've already kind of on a weird back foot with something. I mean, yeah. Voidfall is a game that seems like it's lived up to its height and, and beyond. But some other games that may have come out um, might look at and go, that was okay. Like it wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be. And therefore I'm already on the a strange back foot. And like you say, there's so many great games out there. Yeah. Sometimes I'm just like, why, why, I don't want to play this. I'd rather play that. Maybe we need to interrogate you a bit further, Def. Did you teach him Kanban EV after back-to-back -back Voidfall games? Was he a little bit tired <laughs> after that? <laughs> I did not, but interesting you should ask him because he did. I did ask him, and he did single out three games out of everything he's played so far. Okay. And those three games have been Spirit Island, Voidfall, and Age of Steam. And ah. so, you know, he still enjoyed, for instance, Mage Knight. He loved it, uh, wants to play again. 
um, loves Nuklum. Having said that, we played Baraz last night and we all agreed, you know, this is a fantastic game mm. uh, and we'd rather play this right mm. now. So th- the three games that have stuck are those three. So it will be interesting to see what the final tally is when he leaves in, in a few days' time. And I know that when you've talked about gaming with your brother in the past on the podcast and he said Gaia Project is the greatest. Has he made any comparisons for those new three favorites in, in comparison to Gaia Project? Not yet, but um, I am counting on, on him making those comparisons before he leaves. So okay. we, I'll be reporting back to see what he thinks versus Very that. Good. But I do think, based on what I see from him, I do think Barrage would probably be his favorite right now. I mean, he's not insane. Of course he is. <laughs> he's not <laughs> insane. <laughs> Uh, it's so there you go yeah it's been it's been great to to play with him and um he you know catches on to games really really quickly which creates some some pretty awesome competition and uh last night's barrage game against him and dimmy was let's say uh uh, difficult (laughs) Uh, i'm I'm gonna call it level Expert level, I almost ended up, I think, like 50 points behind both of them. So, yeah, uh, uh, it's, been, it's been fantastic. It's been great. And, um, yeah, we still have a few, a few days left. And it's been interesting as well because I've been introducing him to my game group and he's been coming along. Great. And after the fact, he said, I was really concerned about these meetings because I was like, I don't know these people. He's yeah. a bit of a, you know, he likes his safety zone. Mm-hmm. He doesn't, you know, make make new friendships easily and all that. And he was also a bit concerned about how they're going to play and their attitude and all that. And afterwards, he was like ecstatic about everybody he's met, that everybody's been so warm with him, um, Adrian and Dan and other people that he met at the game day as well as the the game groups. Uh, He's just made so many positive comments. He's been genuinely impressed with what he's said about, about the people that he's met from this community, which makes me think we're not crazy when we say that this is, you know, uh, an amazing place full of amazing people and we're pretty Absolutely. lucky to be a part of it. But it's very interesting to see that coming from somebody that's completely new and a bit stranger to the culture and, uh, you know, uh, even even to the board game scene. Mm. Very, very fresh. So, mm. yeah, yeah. That's great. I, I love hearing about these family board gaming stories and, yeah, it's incredible the the journey your brother's been on even just you know a year or so into board gaming but i think adrian's mum story just beats that out. <laughs> oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think there should be a book from teotihuacan to on mars in 10 days or something yeah. like it, that needs to be the title of the book yeah. get it signed by you know <laughs> the italians and by <laughs> vitalis or whatever and then We'll publish it. We're yeah. actually we're actually playing a game of Teo on BGA at the moment, me and my mum. So we still play go. Teo. So that's, that's great. Fantastic, right? yeah. That's fantastic. I actually have another story as well that involves Def's brother. At the game day, I was incredibly busy because it's a very busy day, and Finn was there this time because he's on school holidays, and you know he was hanging out and he played a lot of games himself. He played more games than I did. How about that? which is kind yeah. of fun. And he actually played a game of Azul with Def's brother. And that was really cool. He just like, yeah. his, Def's brother came up and was like, how you doing? And I was like, oh yeah, really good. It's a busy day. And then Finn's like, oh, I want to play a game. I want to play Azul or something. And then your brother was like, I'll play. And he's like, cool, let's go. And then it's just, they went and sat down on the table together and just played Azul like, head great. to head. So it was pretty fun. Finn came over and goes, he smashed me down. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. It's, it's really interesting. He had a bit of a surreal game day because he played a game with Finn, who, mm-hmm. you know, and then at the same token, turned around, he played a game of Dune Imperium with Martin Wallace, who, <laughs> you know, coming from Greece and then coming to this game day and sitting together playing game with Martin Wallace, the, the, you know, he, he had a pretty surreal day. So that's, that's great. Pretty great. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, before we move on as well, back to the Boxing Day thing. So we'll just take a step back again. I played a garden game, which I've oh, never yes. been into like money gardening. I've played a bit of croquet back in my day when I was an earl and all that. 
But now over here, I don't get to play as much croquet. Oh, you're talking about a physical game outside, yes. right? Yes. Like not, not, not a garden-themed board. No. <laughs> I was we like, played, three sisters, dude. Yeah, we played <laughs> Kub, right? That's how you say it, Kub? I and think so, yeah. It was brilliant. Like, I've, it's, you know, it's like, it's not just like toss rings on onto uh Spikes, a stick, a stick yeah. or and it's not just throw a beanbag in a hole. This had skill and tactics and strategy, and it was brilliant. We played it two v two, and got to play it with, you know, I got to see other people play it. I got to play a game much later in the day, but it was great to see people playing that and, and getting use out of that. So, if anyone is looking for like a garden game to play with their family, I would really advise you can get a Kmart for ten bucks. Like it's just some sticks and some little. Uh, there's a knight, uh, not a knight, a king, and yeah, fantastic game. Really blown away at how fun it was, and we've played it many, many times over this Christmas break. So, yeah, yeah. It, it is a good game. I will say, probably for me, the best lawn game is Finska. That's okay. really good. I've never played that. But yeah, I've, I've I enjoyed this, and cro- I think you'd really like Croquet Jewels. Because it's literally screwing up everybody. Like that's what you do <laughs> is like you knock their balls out of the way, trying to get a better position for yourself. So I, I really think you'd dig it. So yeah, I probably can, would. I'll get it, and we'll do it next year or year after. Sounds so good. It'll be fun. So, so uh, I've played not as many games as I would have liked to over the break, but I have played a few, and I've got some even before the Christmas break that I just didn't have a chance to talk about because I wasn't on a podcast before we launched into our top games of all time episodes. Um, one of them I want to mention was Valka. So, that was on Kickstarter late last year, and the designer is in Melbourne and I reached out and said, hey, I really like the look of the game. I'd love to have a, a go at it if you've got a copy floating around. And they said, yes, I've got one prototype with me and they uh, mailed it up and I played it a bunch and it was really good. I, the artwork is what really captivated me and I think it was shared around the community a bunch as well. But Valka was a, a simple card game. You could play it multiplayer or solo. I mostly played it solo. And it was just a fun puzzle to try and solve. You've got soldiers that you can give upgrades to. You're rolling dice to see if you can defeat them. And you're trying to work your way through all these stacks of minions in order to try and defeat them. I will say I did message and say before I sent it back that it was really, really hard. But I know that um, they have been tweaking the rules a little bit and and uh, balancing those rules a bit because I think uh, um, the designer said that they'd gotten a little bit used to and knew the tricks of the game to sort of get into a good position to winning it, um, but I wasn't able to figure that out. <laughs> um, but they are tweaking things a little bit to make the solo a little bit less punishing, but really fun solo um, mode, nice production that they've got. It'll have a nice cloth map. The artwork is great, really cool aesthetic. I really dug the times I got to sit down and play that solo. So I had good fun with Valka. Uh, another one I want to talk about that I played more recently, and I I played it with Mitch, just a head-to-head game. And I think he talked about this on the podcast a long time ago. It was a game called Outlaws. And it was really, really cool. You have, it's kind of like... Is that a two-player game? It is a two-player game, yes. Yeah, okay, that rings a bell. So, basically, you have a bunch of characters that are big standees and you line them up in front of you, yourself and they sort of line up making rows with your opponent. So, you've got nine slots and they face, um, you know, hit, they're hidden to your opponent, but they're in line with another card on your opponent's side. And they have a bunch of actions. And what you're tr- there's a couple of win conditions. You're trying to either collect vote tokens and have um, your... Oh, I can't remember the president or something like that. Collect the 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 winning um, the winning token, or you want to have the the bandit assassinate the the the, uh, the governor. I think that's what it was called, or you want to have the sheriff arrest the um, the bandit on the other side. So, it because it's all him, in hidden information. What you're sort of doing is you're revealing characters to be able to look at tokens in the middle between the two characters and 
so you give information to your opponent about what is in that position, but you get to get information about what's in the middle and you can swap them around. So you've got to try and keep track of where they might have moved to. It was very easy to pick up, very fun. We played back-to-back games. I just thought it was really good, really nice production. It was a, I think it's an older Kickstarter that not many people have heard about, but I had a great time playing Outlaws, really, really enjoyed that one. Nice. Uh, also, I might mention another one before I shoot over to any if you guys have got anything else to talk about. I'm sorry, Def. Um, I twisted Mitch's arm. I'll just say uh, under duress, he is playing Undaunted Stalingrad with Boo. me. <laughs> Boo. Um, where? What do you think? So I, I'm really enjoying it. That's um, great. That's it's, great to hear. It's such a good system. It is. I know there's a lot of dice rolling, but yes. who cares? It's a lot of fun. Uh, I think the system is brilliant. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I'm, I can't remember. Mitch is definitely the one that taught me the game. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember. I'm pretty sure we played a, a regular game of Undaunted Normandy first before then deciding to play Undaunted Stalingrad. Sure. We're, just, we're four games in. I think you play 15 missions total over the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And it it's you know there's not really any spoilers here, but you know the the map tiles can change over the course yeah. of the game. You're going to be losing units permanently, but also upgrading units, so your decks become asymmetric right after the first game. It, it's in small ways, but I can see the trajectory the game's going over. We're going to end up with very different decks a, as it goes on. Yes. Uh, the stories are written quite well. They're kind of fun to read. You kind of get a feel for what's going to happen in the scenario. And Mitch won the first two games back-to-back that we played and he went around boasting to everyone that he's just absolutely obliterating me. Well, I'm happy to report on this session I won the next two games. So we're two and two. So we'll see how this goes. Um, but, yeah, I'm having good fun with it. It's not... It's definitely not a game you can take too seriously because there is a lot of dice rolling, mm. but it's really good fun. I'm having a blast with it so far. So it'll be something I've, we just get to over time. I've only played it the once, but I really enjoyed the system. I thought mm. it's really clever. And we actually talked about this a little bit yesterday about its system and its likeness to other systems on that yes. Patreon episode. And, yeah, it's it's very clever, and I'd love to see how far they can they can push it. Yeah. So, so yeah, a, a little spoiler into the Patreon episode. One of the games we'd mentioned there was the space-themed Undaunted that will be coming probably this year. Yes. And I'm really curious to see what they do with that one, what they can – because it, it's so thematically tied to the war history that it's in – they use as a current setting – but space in the future, they can kind of do whatever they want. So I'm very, very interested to see what they creatively can come up with and integrate into that system they've made. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I think they have an opportunity to change the system up a bit to Mm -hmm. allow for the fantastic setting. But at the same time, I think the system is quite established and has proven to be extremely successful. So they can't really go wrong with this one. They they leave the system as is and just adapt it for the new setting or they create some new stuff. I think it's going to be a huge success either way, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. Very excited for that. Talking about dice chucking and elements of luck, I'm just going to put it out there. The two losses that I've had against Finn in this game, it was all luck, right? He won on <laughs> luck. So, sure. yeah, I'm getting that out of the way at the start. But... After hearing Mitch talk about him and Brad playing Dice Throne together, and and I introduced Dice Throne to Thin maybe like two years ago when he was six, and he got the concept, but he didn't really. I wouldn't say he en- he enjoyed it, but I, I wouldn't play it with him regularly because I was having to do a lot of help and a lot of he couldn't read all of the abilities and fully understand it all. But now. He's all over it, and he had a blast playing that. He played the monk back to back. He played it one. He's like, "Well, I'm not going to change it. I just won." So I played the paladin, and then I switched over because we've just got the OG dice throne. And then I switched over. I think it's like the inferno something or other. It's like the the mage that uses fire damage kind mm-hmm. of thing. But yeah, we've had a real good time playing that, and it's it's kind of a funny thing that like I don't love the game if i'm honest 
but I really love the experience of playing it with him and having the enjoyment yeah. with him. And that's actually made me enjoy the game because now I'm like, I'm too down. I have to win. I can't yeah. just keep losing. And it's, it's, it is fun and it does have really good gotcha moments. And there is some strategy into it. It's not just throwing dice because you have the card play and the other things that are involved with the game. So it isn't just battle Yahtzee, even though it is slightly battle Yahtzee. Like, yeah, it's been great. And I don't know if I would buy more at the moment, but I have enjoyed the games that we've played and hope to play it more and get more out of it. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Very cool. All right. Well, I I might move on to my sizzling game at this point. And this is one I got to play before, in between my last podcast and, and now. I didn't get to talk about it for a while. I played it at a local game group and it's been out for a while now. I also got, I got to play it with Kim um, from Good Games Publishing as well. And that is the quest for El Dorado. Yeah. Have either of you played this? I have not. I haven't, but I've seen it everywhere. It's at every game day. And oh. I see that box floating about like, yeah, it's, this, it's being played. This game is just brilliant. So the quest for El Dorado is a really simple deck builder and racing game. So you have a bunch of tiles that have different terrain types. There's rivers, there's desert, there's forest, and there's impassable mountains as well. And you start off with a deck that has a bunch of symbols that match those terrain types. And on your turn, it's very simple. I'm pretty sure it's, it's standard like a lot of other deck builders are, where you draw five, you play them all, and then you discard anything you didn't use and draw five for the next turn. And you're trying to just race to the very end where El Dorado is. Now, these cards have symbols on them, like it might have one um, hatchet for the forest. And every position on these uh, hexagon grid tiles has symbols that match it. So if you want to go through a particular forest tile that has a value of one, you need to spend a card that has like a one hatchet to make your way through. And there's sections that get progressively harder and the whole board is modular. So you've got different setups and there's different scenarios in the rule book. And you've got cards that allow you to buy things from a market as well. So you get more powerful cards. Very simple standard deck builder, but just a really fun game and a tension of you're trying to... Because there's so many different paths you could take to get to the end. And you're trying to carve out the path that is working with the deck you're trying to build. You might specialize in one type of terrain and you'll go faster, but then your deck's not as good at getting through the forest and so you're going to slow down and other people catch up. It's just... It's really fun. It takes 45 minutes to play. And we played back-to-back games because we had such a fun time. It also comes with a bunch of modules. So the market of cards you can introduce in the game is different every time as well. So there's lots of variety in terms of the cards you can build into your deck. Did you play a two-player game, Jules? It was, or was it more people? It was four players both times. Okay. Uh, turns are very snappy because you yeah. kind of got your hand and you go, cool, well, you know, I've got a couple of options, but it's not so many options that you're like, I don't know where to go, what's the right decision? And it's quite cleverly done in that there are some locations on the board that are a little bit out of the way, but it allows you to trash cards from your deck so you can start to refine it a little bit. Uh, It was just so much fun. This is a game, if someone brought it to the table, I would just be like, yep, sign me up, no brainer, happy to play this. I, I think I'd like to get myself a copy of this one. So easy to introduce, introduce to any people that don't play board games They'll pick it up super quick. Absolutely loved this one. Quest for Eldorado. Eldorado was a massive hit for me. Very good. It's nice. very cool. Is it when you say it's been out a while? How old is it? Do you know? Like, because I've seen it like everywhere. Oh, so yeah. So that's a good question. Um, and I've heard other things Geek, as well. Sorry, 20s. I've heard other things as well. Yep. Like when you place out the maps and stuff. You need to follow what the like the actual booklet says. Is that correct? Rather than doing your yeah. own, because otherwise it takes up a lot of table space. Is that correct as well? 
yeah, it it take it does take up a bit of table space. There are a bunch of scenarios, and they tell you how to set up the board in mm. the, in the rule book. I think once you've played it a bunch, you probably could make your own map and just have some really funky combinations of terrain mm. types that um, have different you know ebbs and flows to them. But according to Board Game Geek, it came out in 2017. I don't okay. know. It f- I feel like it's older than that. Yeah, me too. Mm, mm. But that might be just the most recent reprint. Yeah, maybe. So it's it's, it's definitely had a couple of versions before. Um, no. But yeah, it's it's a fantastic game. It's actually ranked 120 overall on Board Game Geek, so it's it's up there. Yeah, F- just highly recommend if you get a chance to play this one. Do it. It's great fun. It's quick. It's easy. There's a lot of tension in the race to get to the end because it's just mm. first to reach the end wins. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. great yeah. game. Cool. Excellent. Um, actually, bef- sorry, there's one more thing I should point out that's important yeah. about the game. There's actually like these little markers that are like thresholds that you have to spend resources to get past, but it's only the first person to reach the threshold has to do that, then it unlocks it for everyone else to just pass through. So it's actually quite a clever mechanic to keep everyone in pace because the leader has to spend these extra resources to get past this barrier. And the barriers have like a a number value and they act as a tiebreaker, like if two people mm. reach the end of the same turn. I did want to mention that. It is first to get their wins, but if two people manage to do it in the same round, then you go to those barriers and whoever has the highest value barrier they've collected will win the game. But yeah. very, very clever. Absolutely love it. Well, I will talk about my sizzle if that's cool. Yeah, go for it. It's, it's a family game that VR Distribution's actually sent to us and... They sent it to us because they sent us D- Disney Dixit, which mm-hmm. is fantastic. Loved Disney Dixit. Had a few plays of it. It's been smashed at the game days. Great game. Yeah, I'll talk about it another time in the future. But they sent Mysterium Kids. Now, why that's important and this time of year is quite important is that when we've been to Def's house at New Year's Day in the past and other days in the past – We've played Mysterium with his kids and Finn's been there and Finn can't be the ghost because he's Mm. just not old enough to understand all of the concepts and the shuffling of the cards and where things go and and how it actually works, right? So Mysterium Kids, even though it's not really like Mysterium, it's a very different game. We'd played a lot of games that day and – you know, Finn was just sort of board game fatigued, let's say, and he went and did his own thing for a little while. And then MJ and I, he just cracked this out to give it a go. And then when he heard the little <laughs> drum that's with it, <laughs> he could not help himself, but come in the room to investigate what was happening and get involved. And he loved it. It's a great family game. It It's really fun. <laughs> I have to say it's a great adults game as well if i'm honest it's really simple the premise is you have a deck of cards you're basically going to a haunted mansion and you're trying to give this information to a ghost basically and the way it works is that in the mansion there's five slots and you place out five cards then you have these tokens and in secret you look at the token and it will be relating to one of those card positions, right? And then what you do is you say, everyone has to close their eyes, and you say, boo. Then you make the noise on the drum. Then you say, boo, to stop. Because sometimes you're relaying the information to multiple cards on the table. So sometimes you might have to say, boo, make your drum noise, boo, make another drum noise, then boo to finish. Mm -hmm. And as you're trying to, tell them what cards they're looking at and try and make them guess the correct cards by just using the little nifty tambourine that I have in my hand. (laughs) So I will give an example. It will be open information example, Uh but I'm showing the guys a card of a steam train. Yep. Steam train on a purple background. On a a track. So I would probably go, So it's like 
the the, the train go chicka 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 chicka. Then the end was two two. Right. <laughs> I would yep. hope that you got that on the cards. It's not easy. I'm going to give you that. But man, it's good fun trying to make the drum do different things. And you can do whatever you want with the drum. Scratch That's it. Great. Rattle it. You know, tap it on your leg to make like a thudder noise rather than like a tinny kind of noise. Mm-hmm. And it's just awesome fun. Like even with adults, like it is great fun. And although in the game you only really do two sounds, you could just for fun just go, we're going to do three sounds. You've got to guess three cards and make it harder for more adults. And it's a blast. Like it's just good, good fun. And it's something different. Do you know what I mean? It's something different. And kids love stuff that's got a drum. And they like stuff that's different. But they have to think like – they're not just smacking the drum and stuff. Like even there was like a chicken, but in the picture of the chicken, it wasn't like a cockerel. He was just eating little bits of grain off the floor. So there was lots of like, there was lots of (laughs) just that, you know, like, cause he's just pecking away at the little feed on the ground. And yeah, it's just a great game. There's a lot of cards. I'd say there's maybe 70 or 80 cards, maybe more. And when they're all laid out, if you guess them correctly, you get bits of treasure and some of the treasures link together and they get you a bonus point if you could link two bits of the same type of treasure together. It's just, yeah, great, easy, takes no time to set up and has lots of great entertainment value for families. So, yeah, really, really rated it. So, yeah, Mysterium Kids. Very good. Oh, that sounds fantastic. That That is something I would have loved as a kid. That yeah. sounds so much fun. Just we- the abstract nature of how do I make this picture into a sound? It's such a fun concept. And it gets really hard when there's two sounds and they sound exactly the same when you've done it. (laughs) And you're like, they sounded the same. Like, (laughs) and it's really hard. You've got to hear all the little sort of scratchy noises to it and everything. So yeah, it's brilliant. So yeah, no, that's cool. All right, Def, you've got something. Yeah, I thought I would skip the sizzle today, given all the discussion about how my brother's visit was going. But I played a game that I think a lot of our listeners would want to hear about, and that is Scholars of the South Tigris. Oh, I am interested. Which is the latest game from Garfield Games in the South Tigris trilogy, I suppose. The second one after the Wayfarers, Mm -hmm. which was the first one. And I have to say... I didn't back this, so I played uh, my friend Adnan's copy, who was kind enough to give it to me for a few days. And the reason I didn't back it was because I was somewhat disappointed by Wayfarers. I was super keen on the theme of the South Tigris trilogy because of the whole, you know, I guess, uh, scientific knowledge exploration in in the Middle East and all of those um, historic periods are very, very interesting. And so I was very, very sold on on the actual setting of of this trilogy. And Wayfarers fell fell a bit uninteresting to me. I thought the tableau building was really cool. I thought that was really good and being able to do actions and stuff. But the main board just did not feel as interesting to me. So I went, the the reason I'm prefacing with this is to explain that I went into this game with, you know, tempered expectations. Mm -hmm. And so this went kind of like this. We set up the game. Dimi, my wife, was really keen to play it because she enjoyed Wayfarer. She likes all of the Garfield games. Mm -hmm. She was really keen to play it. My brother was keen to play it. We set it up about, I think, maybe 30 30, 45 minutes in, Dimi just ups and leaves and says, I cannot play this, sorry. And, and we, we just cancelled the game. Like it was oh. it was that bad. And the main reason was the confusion of the colour mixing. So the way Scholars of the South Tigris works is you have the three basic colours and you have three colours that come out of mixing these basic colors. And so these play the role of resources. So you have some dice in your bag, and when you take them out and you roll them, you use these dice to take actions. And some of the actions require a certain value of a dice Mm -hmm. uh, without regards to the color. Some others require a specific color, 
but don't care about the value. And some, it, it you know, you get the point. They, they require both. But the way it works is the whole game is the manipulation of these dice because you can combine a yellow and a blue to make a green dice, which is a, a secondary color. But then you can use a green worker to to make to make the dice increase in value. Or I, I I can't honestly remember if there's green workers, but there's workers that you use to either make the dice a six if it's of the same color of the worker, or to change the color of the dice if it's a white dice. And I I actually found this more interesting than Wayfarers I, because. After this disaster of an evening, uh, my brother and I set it up again next day, and we said, you know what, we were all very, very tired last night. Let's, you know, Dimi doesn't want to play it. Let's give this an, another go. And we played, and we enjoyed it, but we both felt it fell a bit long, mm-hmm. which was the same case for Wayfarers for me. But I think the game has a lot of interesting decisions around how you manipulate the colors and the workers and the dice. There's a lot of interesting decisions to be made as to how you use these. And I think that from that aspect, I think this is more interesting than Wayfarers of the South Tigris. I don't know if that's what the overall consensus is. Uh, Have you guys played Wayfarers? I have played played Wayfarers, Wayfarers, yes. Did you guys like it? Um, yeah. I I enjoyed it. I, I it's been a while since I played it, but I think I probably agree with you, Def. The main board and just moving the tokens further along felt quite disconnected from the main game, which is definitely mm. that that scene you're building. Um, but overall, oh. fun puzzle game, but not really my style of game. Yep. I didn't have I a problem with the think central that board. For me, scholars. Okay. I, I really liked it. I I just think okay. that I prefer that that game and Paladins at two player. I think it really is a lot better because you get that metronome feel Agreed. where it's back, forward, back, forward. And sometimes, even in both of those games, I've just gone boom, 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 done my action, and I'm already then the next player's done their action before I've almost back to my turn again and i'm like oh god they've already they had their turn planned and now i've got to be thinking about my next turn and i really like that and i find their games have the most annoying push and pull that my brain can't comprehend do you know what i mean like i'm i've got to get this (laughs) but if i get this i can't get that and now oh god where was i again and that's really good i love that bit but i find that they especially in paladins oh lord paladins but yeah it's great. <laughs> With Scholars of the South Tigers, I probably should take a step back and explain what the game is about. I kind of dove into on the action selection mechanic, but the game is about translating scripts. And so there's these translators out on the main board that you have to hire. And when you hire a translator, they only translate into or between specific languages. And the goal is obviously always to translate a scroll to Arabic. And you could go either through a translator that translates that specific language to Arabic. So if, it's a, if say, it's a Greek scroll, a translator translates Greek and Arabic, then they can do a direct translation. But you could do multi-step translation. So you could hire that translator to translate from Greek to you know, Syriac, and then that translator over there to translate from Syriac to Arabic. And so this creates a very interesting flow of the game, which Wayfarers, I thought, didn't have, because Mm. these translators usually have an influence on them by some of the players, and so you have to pay them to, to use them. Okay, that's cool. But at the same time, when the translators uh, are are used, when their services are used, they gain a gold. and each translator has different requirements uh, for gold. And when those requirements are met in full, after a couple of translations, they retire. Yeah, And so it becomes an interesting balancing mechanic between, I really want to use the translator, but I don't want them to retire yet because we have nobody else that translates this language yet. So 
I did feel that this was a much more central part of the game than Wayfarers, where the central part I thought was just the tableau building with the cards that you, you did in front of you. In Scholars, you also have like these six technology tracks for science, mathematics, and chemistry, and biology, and all of that, that you go up and they give you different things in the game. And you have a little sort of mini game which abstractly describes traveling around the Arabic Peninsula and, you know, meeting with people and finding these scrolls and retrieving them. And so that's how you get new scrolls into the into the um the domes or the the um they have a different name, but they have you have like the three the three domes on the right hand side where you mm-hmm. move in the scrolls and then you you use the translators to to move them to Arabic. And I just thought that I didn't mind the color mixing and all of that. That felt a pretty nice puzzle to me. I enjoyed it. I wasn't blown away by it, but it didn't bother me. I, I thought it was good fun. And I thought that the main aspect of the game, which was translating the scrolls, really comes through in the game. Like you, th- That is the main thing you have to do in the game. And I thought that was really nice. The only criticism I guess I have, again, like I mentioned before, is the game does feel very long for what it gives you because there's no there's no you know particular engine building here. There's no there's no sense of progression in terms that, oh, you know, now I'm translating one scroll and then later in the game I'm gonna be doing it multiple times or whatever. Mm. You always do the same thing again and again. Right. What changes over time is your access to translators, but also, you know, how high you've gone up on these six scientific tracks because they give you different things when you when you go up, but also when you rest, when you when you pass, um, when you don't want to take an action and you rest, then you get all sorts of things, and you put all your dice back in your bag. So there's a bag building element as well, which I I really enjoyed. I thought that was really fun. You get penalized for having white dice in the end and all, all sorts of things, you know. The, the goal is to translate the scrolls, but also advance in this sort of color mixing mini game a bit. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would want to play a couple more times before, you know, I decide if it is indeed better than Wayfarers. But from the first play, I it definitely gave me much better vibes than, than Wayfarers. So... Yeah, Scholars of the South Tigers, I think if if you're used to Garfield games and their systems, all of these games have a very similar feel to them. You're not going to be disappointed by this. It does give me more of a Paladins feel than Wayfarers did. And like you said, Adrian, I don't think I would want to play these games in more than two players. Architects is a different story. But yeah, Paladins, different. Wayfarers, Scholars... Maybe scholars, I don't know, but they just feel like two player games for me. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, and I know you're not. No, no, no. I, I'm not I know you're not saying that either. No, no, no. But like, I, I, I love playing these games at two because of that metronome turn taking. It really just bounces backwards and forwards. So yeah. even when the game goes for like an hour and a half, it doesn't feel like it at all because it's you, you're basically constantly doing stuff because it's like. You know, no one's really stuck for very long. There's not a massive amount of AP where you're having to think, oh, God, where can I go? What can I do? You've got very limited choice because you've put yourself in that situation. You've picked those workers, and that's all you can do. And, yeah, I really enjoy that element of, like you say, of Paladins and of of Wayfarers, the fact that it is very much like a metronome. That's how I would describe it. It's like bip-bop, bip-bop, back and forward. It's great. So, yeah, I hear Cool. I do like the sound of it, so I'm pretty keen to give Scholars of the South Tigris a go. Mm. Very good. All right. Well, with all the board game talking and, and sizzles done, I think we might move on to talking about some news. So the first of which will go in the order of which these events are going to happen, and that is the Brisbane Game Day on March the 23rd. And it's at a different venue this time. I might let Adrian talk about that. Yeah, I would just like to thank 
the volunteers at the last game day. And I mean, we do thank them during the day and there's a big thank you and a round of applause for there. But I have to admit, like I started packing my car at like 6 a.m. to get there at the last one and we went till 2 a.m. I bailed out at 1.20 a.m. I was like, I have to go. I literally, I have to leave. I, I am starting to hallucinate. I need to go home. I need sleep. This is crazy. But luckily enough, I can't remember all the people that were there, but I think maybe Tara was there at the end at 2 a.m. G Money was there at 2 a.m. against his will. <laughs> Matt, Matt, Matt Woods was there at 2 a.m. having a great time by the look of the photo, but he was G Money's lift. So I don't think G Money had much of a choice. So these are all guys, these, G Money, Matt Woods, Tara, these are all volunteers that help out at the Brisbane Game Days. And yeah, it was like the community, they showed up for that game day. Man, it was great. It was a fantastic day. So yeah, huge thanks to everyone that came. But the next game day is in March, March the 23rd. And it's at the Royal on the Park Hotel in the city. There is options for parking, which is $6 for all day and $8 for all day. You can just Google that and the information comes up. It's really simple, but you cannot book your parking until 30 days before the event. But I am told that there's never an issue. There's plenty of parking, so don't stress out about it. And there's also much better public transport for people. A lot of people want to use public transport and they can't because the last venue was quite hard to get to for people in the north of Brisbane. But anyway, I have it on rumour and kind of good authority that I think all of the board game barbecue crew are there. I'm not 100% if everyone is, but I, I'm 99% There's sure, a good sure chance everyone is going to be there. Yeah, well, so Certainly the Sydney contingency will be road tripping up. Yeah. And I know Dan's coming, so it just leaves Connor unexplainably hopefully coming, but he is working on it and hopefully he'll be there. So that would nice. be pretty good. So yeah. So Very all good. There? Yeah. No, that's going to be a good time. And it's a bigger venue, so we can have yeah. more people there. The I will say the last Brisbane game day, it sold out and we had people again messaging us saying, I didn't get a ticket. As soon as it's live, which it is right now, go buy your ticket because, yeah. you know, it sells out. Uh, hopefully we, I mean, I'd love to have another sellout at a bigger venue, but, you know, hopefully we can accommodate more people and have a great time. Mm. Yeah. So the next one to talk about is one we have mentioned many times, but even more exciting now, we've got PlayCon. It's happening this year. <laughs> yeah, it's the first time we could say that, right? It is the very first time we can say that. And yeah, that's pretty cool. for those who maybe missed the details on that, we are hosting a board game dedicated convention in Sydney from the 12th to the 14th of July this year. It's going to be three days of epicness. There'll be lots of opportunity to play games. We'll have prizes. There's going to be panels and all sorts of other events. So you can actually go to the website play-con.com if you want to see more information. The tickets are still selling. And I, I hope that we can see heaps of people from all over Australia there. We're trying something new and we want to bring the board gaming community together. It's going to be epic fun. I would love that the Jackbox event that's at like 11 o'clock at night can get turned into a pyjama Jackbox event. <laughs> so I can just stay in my PJs and then go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm very much looking forward to it. Like there's been a lot of effort put in and we really hope that we can bring it. And I have to say that the community, not even just board game barbecue community, people outside the community have like shown up. Like tickets are going really crazy. I think we're like 40% already done yep. so yep. i mean we've still got seven months to go and yeah just a massive thanks to everyone that supported this event so far please share it with your friends and share it with people that you know anyone that's like i said touched a board game in the past 10 years just yeah show them show them the way and yeah this will be a great great event so yeah and while we're talking about playcon i'll just thank the sponsors for playcon as well so we have more than meeples which are a board game store in brisbane we have behold games which tina runs here in sydney a fantastic store as well 
And we've got two publishers, Leader Games and Board and Dice, which are sponsoring the event as well. So thank you to all of those people, as well as Gameway Gaming Tables, who make fantastic products in Melbourne. So thank you to all those major sponsors for helping us get PlayCon going. If you're looking for a new board game, you need to check out adventgames.com.au. They have a great range of games, including pre-orders and hot new games. Anything you could be looking for will be there at Advent. Dean provides excellent customer service that is second to none and he's always keen to support the Australian board game community through events, game days, and even through sponsoring a podcast. So head over to adventgames.com.au today. That's adventgames.com.au. All right, so it's been a little while since we've had a podcast. I'm putting my hand up because technically this is not a question of the pod. I'm it's, getting you on a technicality. It is technically not. <laughs> so as if you're an avid listener, you would know our last episodes before our break, we had top 10 games of all time and we didn't pose a question of the pod in those episodes. However, a thing that's happened since we've uh, been recording last is we're ticked over to a new year. And during that period of time, we posed a question on our social media about what is your board gaming New Year's resolution? And we had some responses to that. So, we thought we'd just read out some of that engagement and see what people are talking about, what they're wanting to do with their gaming hobby in 2024. Adrian, do you want to read out a couple of responses? Yeah. Jessica says, James and I have a 5 by 10 Five campaign games played ten times each. Wow, big one. We all, yeah, that is that is monstrous. Uh, and we also look looking. We are also looking to play through our entire collection over the next two years. Now, I've been to their place, and they have a decent sized collection. That is that is an effort, and I wish them both the best of luck. I reckon yeah. they can do it. Just post us updates. We yes. love being updated. That there was another person that played like his entire collection for an oath over a year mm-hmm. and he was doing like monthly updates. And that was so cool to see because you just, and I think he did it in alphabetical order or something. And so we were getting to see his progress. Which yeah, that's cool. right. Yep. So yeah. See. So I'll read out a response. We have Edward said launch and fund galactic cruise. So that's, that's an exciting game coming up on crowdfunding and we may or may not have a conversation with them in the future as well. So that's a that's a fantastic goal to have this year, launch and fund a game. We've got Ryan that said, start tracking stats again. I used to use BG stats, but fell out of the habit a fair while back. Now, I might talk a little bit more about that a little bit later, but we'll read a few more responses as well. Uh, Def, do you want to read a couple off? Sure. Brandon says, to get my cost per play down on all my games at least $5 per play. I found that you can see your total collection value based on purchase price and BG stats. And that number was scary and in need of some further justifying. I, I think you're the master of getting cost per play down, Def. Maybe you need I, to offer some advice. <laughs> I, I don't know what you're talking about. Guy Project <laughs> still has not reached 100 plays. It's sitting at 96. So <laughs> I could yeah. have like three copies and I would still be able to justify three copies of the game. I would have loved to have justified that for my barrage plays because I've had – over 150, right? Yeah. And the problem with that is I've bought everything. So the play count, the expense has gone up so that when you divide it all up, <laughs> it's not actually that good anymore because I've yeah. got the wooden wheels, I've got the coins, I've got the insert, I've got the five-player board. So, yeah, they need to stop making content so I can catch up and, and make it like, you know, a worthy <laughs> purchase. Oh, that's yep. great. And Marco says to go through the stats at least – my games that either haven't been played for around 12 months or more, or ones that have played less than five times total. Then make a priority to play these and ensure they still belong in the collection. That's fantastic. All right, uh, we've got Pack the Maniac said to play any game on my shelf once this year. And we started big yesterday. Scythe, Viticulture, already done, about 90 to go. That's a great 90s- goal. 90s. A fair bit. Doable. Good yeah. doable. It's doable, but it's a lot. <laughs> that's, and that's two decent sized games out of the way. That's great. Mm. Uh, and one more we'll read off. A Tale of Two Meeples said, we want to get more old favorites to the table. I want to do that too more this year. 
there's always new games coming out and we adrian and i may or may not have talked about new games coming out on a patreon podcast there's so many cool new things but there are some great old games i hang um, hang on a second you had a lot more on that list than i did (laughs) so if you buy those games you're doomed like you're pretty you're pretty reserved but you were like a maniac yesterday you were Uh, like there's this game there's this game and this game and this game you're, you're just, excited. You're just talking about <laughs> the ones I messaged you after the fact that I missed. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot that you missed as well. So. Yeah, so many new games coming out. But yes, plenty of old favorites to get to the table. Mm. Now, with all of these responses, uh, I don't know if you guys have some board gaming resolutions. I made myself one for this year. I just want to keep it pretty simple. I am a person that keeps my stats tracked of what games I've played and how many times. And since I've been doing that since 2020, 2023 was my lowest year for playing board games in terms of play count. I haven't looked into whether it was less play time. Maybe I played more heavy games that took longer to play. I'm not entirely sure. I'm pretty sure that's not the case anyway. But I had a, I think it was like a 13% drop in the number of plays from previous, the previous year. And look, there's things that happened in 2023 that I think probably contributed towards that. But my goal for this year is I want to just average a play of one game per day. So, 365 plays uh, (laughs) throughout the year. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Good luck. (laughs) I I think I can do it. There's definitely days or game days where, you know, I get five or six done. I see you laughing, so I'm not 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 going to mention how many games i played last year so so it definitely like quadrupled my goal <laughs> but i it's doable for me because i have done it in previous years but i would just want to get back to that level yeah that's that's a fair call i wish you the best of luck oh thanks for that adrian two thumbs up <laughs> massive smile <laughs> good luck <laughs> I uh I'll I'll join in on this a little endeavor and this new year's resolution thing. Mm-hmm. I I have two really. One is very very simple. It's just to play more games with Finn, like oh, and nice. introduce him to some other interesting games. Another game I didn't even mention it earlier. We we played It's a Wonderful World. Me, oh, MJ I and love Finn. That. And he we played it maybe 18 months ago and he got it. He had a good time, a little bit of hand holding and, and help. But after we played it back, he actually played it. And as soon as we finished, he said, can we play it again right now? Cause he got a score of like 36 in his first game and mm-hmm. his second game, he got 48. So he already wow. made like a, a improvement good amount of improvement. And he played the same city and everything, which was the science kind of faction, if you mm. will. And yeah, he loved it. He really enjoyed it. He got all the concepts and, you know, understood more about the multipliers and what was important and when to discard cards and when not to. And yeah, great. Really enjoyed it. And yeah, I'm just looking forward to playing more games with him that are perfect for his his uh, level. And the other resolution is kind of the same as Ryan's. We had Ryan from Facebook put in about tracking stats again. And yeah, I did the same. I used to use BG stats. I even got to the point of using BG stats. And when Def hit his timer to start the time, I hit my timer to start the time. (laughs) And I was well into it for a little while. But like everything in my little brain, I always fall off the wayside with stuff like that. And I'm not great at it. And this is a very like genuine plug for a, a company that we've kind of been working with a little bit not really like they have done some stuff and they've asked us some questions and we've helped them with some information but very limited it's nothing really to do with us but after game the app has been fantastic it has been already game changing for someone like me who half does all of my stats like i am not good at keeping them I solely rely on MJ to help me keep them. And now that I have after game and I'm set up on it, I literally don't have to keep more than half of my stats because MJ is doing it. And other people that I'm playing, whenever they log the plays, because I'm a user of that app and they are a user of that app, when they hit go and they put my name in and hit the score, I get a little notification saying, you know, hey, Jules logged a game and it, 
got you got this many points and that many points. Uh, you happy with this kind of thing? And I go, yeah, he's not lying. We got those points all good. And yeah, it was it's really good. Like it's really fluid. It's really simple. There are some other parts to it that I really like even more than the app start uh, the stats side of things. I really like the fact that at the Brisbane game days and stuff now we can use this as a tool for other community members to schedule their own games, Mm -hmm. which is mind-blowingly great when we see some of these massive games getting posted on Facebook and it's very hard for people to arrange this and put it in a feed and then the picture gets lost and, you know, it gets lost in the feed and, you know, it had 10 likes or whatever, but not many comments. But if everybody realizes that if they just go to the After Game app, they'll see the Brisbane game day. And once you go inside there, you can see other after game users are like, Hey, I'm looking to play horses carriage at 11 o'clock looking for three players. And you just press sign up and you're in like Mm -hmm. you're done. And then you meet them at the library 10 minutes before the game starts and away you go. Like it's already done. It's so good. It's a, I know organic plays are great. I'm a big advocate for organic plays at the game days but sometimes some of these games are incredibly hard to organically convince people to sit down for four or five hours to play something like horses carriage of five players. So this is a great implementation of something modern and something new and something that we really could use and utilize in this space. And I mean, all communities could use it. You know, you can, Put, there's other game events. It's not just the board game barbecue events. There are other, other events on there, and we will be using this as a tool at PlayCon. So the more people that use it and get into it, the, the better it will be. And it's a, a New Zealand company, I believe, yes, that are it doing is. it. And, yeah, massive respect to Eric because he's very active in the community. He's asking all the questions and taking a lot of feedback. So, yeah, as a person as well who had an error with the app when I first used it and got a workaround and it now works seamlessly and they're looking at those issues and you hear the updates and see the changes on the Discord, just massive props to how active they are. And, yeah, I wish Eric and the team or whoever else is working on this thing because I only ever talked to Eric, so that's all I know. <laughs> but I just keep saying, Eric, why not? Eric, Eric, Eric. But, yeah, like, wish you all the best with your project, man. And, yeah, massive respect. So. Yeah, I'll I'll take an, another step back and just say this is a fairly new project. So they're iterating, they're adding new features all the time. And as Adrian said, they're figuring out bugs here and there. But this, for me, this is an app. I know we've talked about BG Stats and a lot of people use it and probably will still use it. But after game, as Adrian said, very clean, simple, easy to understand app that because you create an online profile, if a friend logs a game, and says you were playing with them, you don't need to log those stats. It's just automatically put in there. It's a really great networking tool, I think, for board gamers. And it's just uh, an app and uh, a product that we feel will be of great value to the community that we want to support. I mean, Jules was on there the other day and saw that someone was setting up a game in a cafe saying, hey, looking for players for, what was it? What was the game against Spirit Island or something? I think like it, was, it was, yeah. Yeah, it was just it's like a random person in a cafe like four kilometers away from Jules. It's like, hey, I'm sitting in this cafe. I'm going to set up Spirit Island and play it solo. But if anyone wants to join me, come down and, and we'll get into it. And I think it's just such a great idea. Yeah. Like it's, it's really well needed. So. You have the ability in that events feature to set your city so you can see what games people are playing local and, and sign up. And when you jump into the game, it creates a chat room for people in that area to just, in that game, I should say, to organize things a bit better. But yeah, go and Google after game, download the app, have a look around uh, there will be way. There is a way to import all your previous stats if you are a BG Stats user through Board Game Geek. But there will be a more direct way that uh, to go straight from BG Stats to After Game if that's something you want to do in the future. So yeah, just thought we'd give them a shout out. All right, for this week's question of the pod, since we've talked about New Year's resolutions and we've talked about After Game and and BG Stats. I think it's the the right question to ask about stats in general. So we want the question for this week to be, do you keep stats of your board game plays and why? So, Adrian, you've got an answer. 
I don't have an answer because okay. I'm a moron. But I do have a question for the guy who is, I would call the stat, I might be the hype man, but this is the stats man. And that is Death. Death, you keep an obscene amount of information, dude. Like it's phenomenal to look and I really respect it and appreciate it. And I wish I could do it. Why do you do it? I love it. I'm a stats geek, man. Like all all, all map folk are stats geeks. Mm. And so I I just love I mean it's not I just I record the, the the game that we play, who's playing, the scores, but also how much time it took to play. And uh, and the location. And the location. Yes, I know that. <laughs> so <laughs> it I, I just love love stats. It doesn't get me anything you know, in addition from from an enjoyment perspective, but I I do love browsing through them and seeing how much I've played one game versus another and who I've played one game the most or, you know, what game has Dimi played the most. I I have lots of interesting stats. I found that if you keep consistent with these, you, you can come up with heaps of interesting things like what is the game I've taught to most people? Easy answer, Age of Steam, 38 people. Wow. The next, the second game after that is Escape Plan and Guy Project with 25. So 38 is a lot. Yeah. So j- just an example, right? Or how many hours I've spent, you know, playing Guy Project and whatnot. It, it's just, I, I love the the output of it. I, I enjoy browsing through it and having fun with it. I once made a a moving graph showing how the different, you see in these graphs with the bars that move over time and they grow and they shrink depending on what, you know, they show. And I made one of those and it was good fun. I just love stats. It doesn't necessarily mean anything for me and, and the board games I play. And usually, you know, I, I never make any decisions based on my stats, but I definitely love, you know, watching them grow over time. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question, actually. Mm-hmm. Do you ever forget to keep a stat and then get no. frustrated? <laughs> you never <laughs> <forgot>. No. <laughs> it's just too good. Oh, so good. I, I'm i pretty religious about it as well. I, I, maybe I've forgotten one or two over the few years, but I'm pretty sure I've recorded everything. I don't go yeah. as far as deaf to record how long it takes, but I record location and who I played with and all of that stuff. For me- Up what, game, mate. Huh? Up, Up my game. game. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, I think I agree with what Def said. I enjoy all those sorts of stats. For me, what I find it useful for, as as someone who obviously we're in the content creator space for board games, and we get sent a lot of games. There are sometimes games I've forgotten that I've played, and. I can look through my BG stats and go, oh, that game I haven't played in ages. I can see exactly how many years or how many months it was since I played. And it's a nice reminder to me that I want to play it again. There's, uh, Since I have started recording the stats, the one thing that has consistently increased is the number of unique games I've played each year. I played less games last year than any other year, but more unique games. And that just keeps going up and up and up. So it's nice to have that little reminder of what I haven't played for a long time or maybe there's some games that I thought I'd played more than I really had and I want to get it back to the table. It's it's like a nice diary to you know my experience in this hobby and it's kind of fun you, to look you over. Need, you need to up your game like Adrian said. Just looking up my <laughs> stats now. Just, just looking up my stats now. This is how crazy it can get for me. I can tell you which designer I've logged the most plays. Like, uh, you know, there's other tools that get you a compilation of the stats that you keep and spit out different things. And so I have this other thing that says, hey, you've played Vitalis Serta games 221 times. Oh, my Cold gosh. Cold 144. You know, <laughs> Simone Luciani, <laughs> 101. Helge Ostertag, 104. So I just love the the connection it gives me to the the games, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything. The games would be equally enjoyable without mm-hmm. this. But I like the stats. They take their own life. They they, yeah. they become their own thing. I love it. I think 
Uh, sorry, I, I'm going to ask no you. No recording time. Come on, Jules. <laughs> no, Make no. this your New Year's resolution. <laughs> this is it. Oh, man. I just, I just don't know if I can be bothered. <laughs> <laughs> what I think one of my favorite stats, and I talked about, you know, seeing how long it's been since I've, I've played uh, a game last time. I love looking at the number of unique games I've tried. I, I think that's just a fun stat to... And it's something that I feel excited about as I try more and more new things. I'm curious, Steph, how long have you been keeping your stats? So I started in December 2019. So if you okay sc- scratch that, it's now been four full years. December 2020. 29. Yeah, I 2020 sta- to 2023. So four full years yes. plus. I, uh, some so change. we started. At the pretty much the same time because I started January first, twenty twenty. Yeah. Okay. I'm curious. I just want to know how many unique games have you played since then? Yeah, looking at my stats, uh, it says three hundred and forty six wow. different games. I've played three hundred and forty different games. Wow. Yeah, so very, very close. Yeah. That, I, so I found that very close. interesting. For me, I enjoy replayability in games like you guys know but it seems that you know my brain enjoys learning new things all the time so i can't completely shut away from getting new games just to learn them Mm. you know i bought to let them and i learned it and we played a few times did it blow me away it didn't have i enjoyed my plays hell yes Mm. Mm. but i've enjoyed the process of learning a new game as well so i love learning new stuff and so I, I found that we talked about this a few days ago. I found that very interesting that even though the number of plays could be different, the number of games that we've played is very similar. the same. Yeah. That's um, so, very interesting. Let me just look up my unique plays one second. <laughs> 343. So I'm better than you, Jules, but I'm not as good as Death. I'm in the middle. So obviously people can't see the camera there. Adrian reached with his hand and pulled that number out of his rear. <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. Like, I I really admire you guys for keeping the stats. I think it's really amazing. And I like to see them. I like mm. to read them. It's like, you know, I, I find it really interesting. But it's I'm just not able to do it like yeah. i tried and I, I and i did really well and i just fell off the bandwagon as soon as i fall off i'm out and i just don't yeah, care yeah, like, yeah, i've just lost great. interest but and after game has come to the rescue for that the community re- will do it for look, you adrian i'm not kidding it has like it's great <laughs> like I, if you're lazy like me get after game <laughs> it's so good <laughs> but like i'm being honest it's great when i see like it says like mj has logged a play of paladins and i'm like Brilliant. I've done nothing. <laughs> I've got stuff. It's great. But you're also like, I think that I have now, I feel not, res- I feel responsibility to keep it on. As in, like, if someone's not keeping that stat, I will probably do it because yeah. it's once in a blue moon as opposed to constantly Every doing time. it. Every time. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, yeah, I, I think that for me, I just, it's just not my thing. Like, yeah. it's just not. But I really love to see it, and I love to see all this data and information. I do find it really interesting. It's just I'm not very good at keeping up with it. Yeah. So, there we go. Yeah. That's the honest truth. There Excellent. we go. All right. So, just to re- reiterate the question again, do you keep stats of your board game plays and why? So, we'd love to hear your thoughts. We'll post the question on Facebook, Discord, Twitter, Instagram, all those places which we interact with you, the community, and we're keen to see your answers. All right, and before we move on to the last segment, I'll just give a shout-out to the wonderful patrons that support this show. This week, a special shout-out to James Ewing, Jason, Paul Bedford, Cameron O'Reilly, and Damon Quintal. Thank you all so much for your support. It absolutely makes this show happen. We absolutely love all the support we get and can't thank you enough for it. If you are not a Patreon supporter of the show, still, thank you for listening. We appreciate everyone that tunes into the show. We absolutely love engaging with everyone uh, on, on this podcast. The other ways in which you can support the show, if you're not doing that through Patreon, is to be involved in the Facebook community, Instagram, Twitter, all of those places, 
in particular, Discord is a fantastic place. I know we talk about it all the time, but that community is absolutely incredible. There's over a thousand mm-hmm. people on there playing games all the time, talking about games, miniature painting, even video games, pets, food. Growing raspberries. Growing raspberries, just all, so good. all kinds of stuff. It's a great place to hang out. If you listen to the podcast, giving us an Apple podcast rating or a Spotify star rating would be absolutely fantastic. That means the world to us and really does help put the podcast into new ears. It's a massive way to help and support the show. Also, on a sidebar for the Patreon stuff, this is now the last month you can sign up to Patreon to be at the Patreon PlayCon party. We are doing an exclusive party on the Thursday night before PlayCon opens with all the Patreons, and this is now the last, I think maybe two weeks, three weeks from where this airs is the last time to sign up. So if you want to sign up and you're on the fence about it and you do want to hang out at the party and come, yeah. Now's the time to sign up. So. Yeah. So to be clear, it's everyone who's currently a, a patron supporter currently now. And if you sign up before the end of January and maintain that Patreon membership till PlayCon, you'll get an invitation to uh, the Patreon party, which would be fantastic fun. All right. Well, links to all of those places in which you can engage with us will be linked in the show notes. And with that, we'll move on to the last segment, Swear an Oath. All right, so swear an oath time. I know it's been a little bit between podcasts. Hopefully, you guys remember what you were supposed to do, but I'm going to jump in because I had a number of oaths to catch up on, which I'm happy to report I've done them all. So the first one was to play Valka, which I talked about earlier on the podcast. I had another outstanding oath to play Netrunner, which I did with James at the Sydney game day. Had two great back-to-back games of that. Really, really enjoy Netrunner. I still need to find the time to dig into it. I've got my own cards now. I want to make some of my own decks and just explore that further. And the other one was to play Primordial Secrets, which was a Kickstarter I finally uh, was able to get delivered to me. And I played that at the Sydney game day. And I want to play that again. So, yeah, that's all of my oaths fulfilled that were outstanding. I'm fairly certain our master of the the board game barbecue law and history james might tell me otherwise but i'm pretty (laughs) sure i am up to date with all of my oaths now so i have a i'm pretty sure a clean slate he's he's not absolutely (laughs) sure so draven find it there's information on him get him from episode 27 when he said he'd do something and he forgot get him oh dear i'm pretty sure i have a clean slate going into this year (laughs) he keeps saying pretty (laughs) sure (laughs) he keeps saying it (laughs) it's so no one can say i lied (laughs) uh all right so what i want to do is i've made this oath in the past actually i'm doing a repeat oath it's for another hobby which is somewhat related to board games which is miniature painting that i love uh to do as well and there is every year a well not every year but certainly the past few years, been a painting competition at Can called CanCon called the Crimson Brush, uh, which has some phenomenal painters attend. And they took some feedback from last year in that there were some exceptional professional painters that submitted incredible pieces there. And there were, including myself, I, I, I'm, I'm fairly good at miniature painting but I'm certainly not at some of the level of those other people that were there that maybe needed a different category to enter the competition in. So this year there's actually going to be, uh, I think, I can't remember what they're calling it. It's not definitely not a beginner's category. I think it's the standard category and then they'll have a master's category to submit miniatures into. So I'm going to enter a miniature into the standard category and that's it's still not done, the piece that I'm working on at the moment. It's close, but my goal is to, or my oath, is to submit a miniature for competition into the Crimson Brush. I have a question. Yes. What what's like what stops someone as an absolute godlike at painting stuff entering it to the standard and going, boom, I'm a winner. Look at me. Good question. So from my understanding, 
uh, there are some people that are known within the painting community and they'll be like, yeah, anything you're putting in is definitely master tier. Uh, but they will look at the, judge the pieces quickly, um, pr- maybe at when they're submitted, maybe it's after the fact, mm. whether this should be in master or the standard category. So, so they might they might briskly walk past and go, that's a master, get it out of standard, put correct. it up there. Correct, exactly. Yeah, cool. Yeah, nice. So it, it's still an evolving event and it's growing yeah. as well. So, yeah, it's just a bit of fun. And there's no prize money or anything like that, but certainly bragging rights. Hey, look, if they pick up yours and put it in the Masters one and it comes like low in it, it's oh, even better. I would, it's be, like- <laughs> I would be over the moon. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Fantastic. All right, uh, Def, how have you gone? Well, my old oath was to play an 18xx game that I hadn't played yet. Mm-hmm. One of the two I've got left and that was 1846 race for the midwest which was a bit of a gap for me because it is one of the most popular 18xx games out there okay and i'm i'm very happy that i played that with uh, my brother and dimmy and you know i definitely want to play it more times it has to go into that pile of games me and adrian have to play together that you know when we meet once a year or twice a year for these <laughs> things that we, you know, enter at dawn and exit at nightfall. <laughs> yeah, dusk. And, you know, so I, I managed to fulfill that. So I'm pretty, pretty happy with that. And as far as a new oath is concerned, I mean, the oath I've written down here looks pretty scary now that I look at it, but it's it's not as scary as trying to play one of these three or four games I've got on my shelf of opportunity. One is let's see we've got the Isofarian Guard. Oh yep. Frosthaven. <laughs> yes. Oath Sworn. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'll stop there because the, the other one is an 18xx game. So okay. I'm, I'm sure I'll play that. Big eventually. campaigns. So instead I want to swear a more long standing oath to play at least once all of my coin games this year, all of the coin games from GMT. I have A few now, not all of them as I sold a couple that I didn't think I would play, Mm -hmm. but even those few would require significant effort. So, yeah, that that will be my goal this year to play all of my coin games. That's a great one. I'm I'm keen to see the progress. And and would that include any new coin games acquired over the year? That 100% includes new ones that may or may not arrive this year. (laughs) Fantastic. All right, Adrian, round us out. Mate, if there was like an O for like growing raspberries or coffee or something or <laughs> smoking briskets, I would be smashing these things <laughs> like or mowing the lawn. Like I would be like the – I would be just nailing these every week. So, yeah, I definitely didn't get my O done. I know what it is. <laughs> it's to play Anunnaki. I just – it's so hard. Like it's it's – I'm not a solo gamer at all. And I tried to set up solo and I took a look at it and I was just like, it's just not me. I'm just not, I'm not mm. into it. I played a lot of cafe solo. I won't lie. Like that was phenomenal because it's so simple and so easy, but yeah, I really want to get this tabled. It has, like I said it a thousand times, one of the most interesting action selection puzzles. I really enjoyed play testing it like two years ago. So I will definitely get that done. So I'll keep that oath. And then maybe I could make my new oath, like, I don't know, do some gardening or something that I always do. Like, no, in all seriousness, I would just like to play some games with Finn and just report back and let you know what he thought of those games. Because yeah, great. he's got more interesting games at the moment. So I'm going to kind of strike while iron's hot. And yeah, I'll introduce him to some other games that I already know. So see where see where he sits. So He's very good. interested in Teo. And I have seen that Nathan's son has been playing Teo. So um, it's a lot of a game to go through. So maybe I can remove some elements for a first play because we have done a re- one round of it a long time ago. Maybe I could remove some elements to lower the complexity and then just do a few rounds so he gets used to how the dice move and how those things go and, and go from there. And then, hey, maybe next time when my mum comes back, we can have a three generation Teo game. That would be that sounds cool. amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> that's the plan. Okay, that's going to be my oath is to teach Finn Teo. <laughs> We're doing that. <laughs> well, I'll I'll be 
eagerly awaiting to see what Finn's review of uh, Anunnaki is as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly right. All right, fantastic. Well, with the swear and oaths done, that is the end of the show for this week. Thanks, Steph, and thanks, Adrian. That was fantastic. Thank you, guys. It was magical. It was magical. And magical. on that note, thank you, everyone, for listening, and we'll talk to you again real soon. Bye for now. Cheers. Happy New Year. Bye. <laughs> Very simple standard deck builder.